Good morning, everyone. We've had overwhelming interest in the topic, and I think that most people are more informed than I am. So I'm really glad we are joined by Johan and David, who will be navigating us through today's popular discussion and debunking of the myths. In preparation for today, I just Googled why is Poppia important, and there were 993,000 results that came back. And I think we can lay this at the feet of the Europeans. If GDPR hadn't taken off so well and become a global standard, we probably wouldn't be having this discussion. And I think it's the good intentions around protection of the end user from unlawful collection, retention, dissemination, or use of their personal information, which stands out. But if you're like me, I don't use my client's information in a bad way. So surely Papier doesn't affect me. You know, it reminds me of when mad cow disease was a thing and there were two cows standing in the field and the one cow said to the other cow, have you heard of mad cow disease? And the second one said, yeah, lucky I'm a squirrel, so it doesn't affect me. And uh, I, I really think that if you are the cow standing in the field thinking it's not going to affect you, in July next year, you're in for a rude awakening. So we are going to go on not such a gentle journey, and I'm going to hand over to David just to give us an intro into Papia from a layman's perspective so that I can understand it, which will mean that all of our guests will understand it and we'll smash into questions from there. So hi there, folks. Just to give you the headline on what Papia is. So Papia is South Africa's umbrella data protection law. And what that means, it's a set of rules that governs how you deal with data or information. Now, we've had rules in South Africa that deal with data and information in various silos for a long time. If you look at the financial services industry, you've got the long and short-term insurance acts, you've got things like FICA. They've got certain rules that deal with information within that silo. In the healthcare space, you've got certain healthcare legislation. In the credit space, you've got the National Credit Act. But this is the first law in South Africa that applies to information across any business or any organization. And as Daniel said, it seems a bit scary and it feels like we have to lay a lot at the door of Europe. And yes, GDPR is the latest, you know, in the European regulations, but we're very late to this party. And we're reading from a hymn sheet that was written long before GDPR was ever a glimmer in the eye of the European data protection authorities. So Papia is based on treaties that started out in the 80s in Europe. They were codified into directives in the 90s. You had things like the UK Data Protection Act from 1998 that Papia reads a lot like. So in many ways, it's actually a slightly more primitive data protection law than the GDPR. GDPR is sort of the cutting edge data protection law, and no doubt it will be interpreted and understood in light of GDPR, but it's going to bring South Africa from a legal perspective into the 21st, or the 22nd, the 21st century of the uh, information economy. Uh, so hard to keep track of centuries in the current circumstance. Um, but uh, it's very important to be at countries like India, they've had comprehensive data protection law for a long time. It's one of the reasons that a really robust outsourcing industry exists there. And we'll hopefully see the same sort of thing developing in South Africa now that Papier's law. So it is a welcome addition to our legislative framework in these dire economic times. One of the statements we made in preparation is that the myth going around is that this legislation is a bit of a toothless dragon. It's really not going to affect business as much as we're making out. It's almost like a Y2K. Johanna, I want to come to you now, but I'd like, David, just your opinion on that. Sure. You know, that room is not without some evidence out there in terms of what we've seen happen with other South African legislation. So where it's been quite bad is with the Consumer Protection Act. National Consumer Commission hasn't been very effective. If you look at their website, I haven't checked it for a while, but it always used to say content coming soon. And, you know, that legislation has been active since 2002. There's no content coming soon when it comes to consumer protection. But then you look at other things in the financial services space. You look at things like the Financial Sector Conduct Authority, you know, formerly the FSB, doing a lot of work there to enforce that legislation. And we don't really know yet exactly which way Poppy is going. Based on what we've seen from the regulator, they're taking their role very seriously. Um, they've been on several of our webinars as a law firm. And they're gearing up to do things. So my money's on them being a lot more serious and there being a lot more enforcement than there has been. So I think anyone who thinks it's going to be a toothless dragon is going to have to find out if they want to dance with the dragon at their own peril. But Johanna, a question for you from a Commvault perspective. Is Papia just an IT problem and will be dealt with by IT? Daniel, first of all, thanks for having me. Absolutely, I think IT's role is important in obviously the mechanism within Papia. 
we don't have a magic wand that all of a sudden make you compliant, but from a technology point of view, where we can help is obviously finding that sensitive information that you're not aware of. And that gives you the ability then to act to okay. what you need to do with that data. So it's not a, you know, from a technology side of things, as you mentioned, is it an IT problem? I would say, yes, it is a major IT problem from what we can see. If we then basically add on top of that what's happened, obviously we all sitting virtually at the moment with the COVID situation around the world, that's obviously driven a lot of data segmentation. So we've seen a lot of people that bounced into using Zoom, using Teams, collaborating virtually. All of a sudden you've got data all over the show from a desktop, you know, into the cloud. So yes, it's definitely something IT should address in my opinion. But the buck doesn't stop there, does it, David? If they're coming in with handcuffs, is it the IT team that's taken away or, or who it's, is? Yeah, they're not going to be locked up, certainly. And I think it's just a trend in business that uh, business tends to rely on their IT departments to do a lot of things. So they hear pop here, they hear information, they think, oh, this must be something IT has to do. And uh, that attitude is definitely not borne out in the law. And the way I like to spend it with a metaphor is if a business has information and information water flowing through the business, IT builds the pipes, they're the plumbers. They make sure it gets where it needs to go, but they're not deciding what goes into the pipes how much water, what the water pressure is, that's up to business. So you've got to work together. And if you look at the actual wording of the law, so really data protection, whether it's POPIA or GDPR, is a bundle of principles you have to comply with. The one that IT typically gets the most involved with is the information security principle. So that's the obligation to prevent unauthorized access to personal data. So that would be through hacks, leaks, or other kinds of incidents. Okay. And there's two th things that get spoken about in the law that they have to do. They're often referred to as TOMS, which are technical and organizational measures. And even in that name, technical, okay, that sounds like IT's purview, but organizational, that's not necessarily IT's purview. That's the rest of the business. So IT can certainly okay. help and good software can help you do the organizational stuff well, but it's those two things working in tandem that accomplish that one principle. And that is just one of six or eight principles, depending on how you frame them. And IT gets involved okay. in all of them, but it's not just their bag end of the day yeah i mean this is a twofold problem the one is the data that's being given to us and entrusted by customers and then it's how we use that and then how we protect that from being stolen shamila has asked a question will it be in line with the nist privacy framework Sure. Yeah. So NIST is an American InfoSec framework, and it's a cousin to other frameworks around the world. Probably the biggest one that most of the cloud services stick to is ISO 27001. That's from the International Standardization Authority. And NIST is a great one because it's sort of freely available. It was drafted in large cooperation with the American government. Other ones are things like COBIT and ITIL read together. The important distinction to understand between an information security framework and a data protection law is an information security framework is more like a checklist. You can go through the items, you can get audited against it, and someone can say you do or do not comply with the framework, typically. Whereas data protection law is principle-based. There is no certification to say you comply with it. You are always getting closer and closer to compliance. Compliance is very situational. It depends on your circumstances, the resources you have available to you. So whether that should be the case or shouldn't, you know, if you actually look at the text of something like ISO 27001 versus GDPR, for example, and I'm using GDPR because Pop yeah, doesn't say yeah. this, GDPR specifically talks about encryption, right? But it doesn't tell you what level of encryption you need to use. Now, nor does exactly. 27001, it gets into a little more detail, but you can be certified by an independent certification authority against ISO 27001, but you can't be certified against GDPR yet. It may happen, okay. but it's not happening anytime soon. I think many of us who work in IT are certifiable, but that's a whole different vibe. <laughs> yeah, it is a, a different, different story, yeah. Yes. Um, so if we're working for a multinational and they are GDPR compliant, does that roll down to South Africa and Papia then is just taken in for granted that we are Papia compliant? That phrase, people throw it around a lot, GDPR, Papia compliant. It's kind of an empty claim because compliance makes you think there's a checklist. There's something you can say that you, yes, I've done these 20, 200 things and I comply with it. Data protection is not a list of 200 things. It's a list of six to eight principles that get interpreted in different ways. You are compliant if you say you're compliant. It's more about governance and getting your structures right. It's more about 
having documented things correctly? Have you got your record of processing activities? Have you done impact assessments when yeah. you need to do them? If you've done all those things, then you can claim compliance. So it's a useful tool that anyone can kind of say it, but don't glibly accept anyone who says they're GDPR compliant. That is an invitation to ask them for other things. So just pause there, David. So Johan, this is the compliance that David makes. That these principles need to be baked into the business and they're a continuous improvement improvement, a continuous cycle. So does that mean our business needs to almost the way we do yearly certification for our OEMs, we should be looking at popular yearly checks on where we are, the health essentially of the organization? I would definitely say yes, that's a good place to start. As David said, I think the governance is the important bit that you need to sort of pin down in the organization. It's a continuous thing. You have to keep on at it. So okay. in other words, today... So we if, never reach popular compliance. No. We reach a stage of health and then the hackers will find a new way to get into it and we've got to carry on. And then id 10 users will leave their laptops open and we get to another... Okay, so we, it's a continuous it's a, it's thing. It's a continuous thing because I think to add on to what you're saying there, there's a perception sometimes that, you know, I go and scan everything now and I find all the bad stuff and I make sure I get rid of it. Um, okay. That's a once off process, but you have to keep on going. So going it's at it. It's like going to yeah. gym. You can't go to Correct. gym once and then you're fit. Okay, no, no, now I get it. Avita asked for you, David, just to please repeat your checklist. What are the six principles that you would have? So uh, I just want to caution you. It's not a checklist. So uh, it's a bundle of principles. Avita, in, be cautioned. <laughs> in Papia or, or GDPR. And, okay. and I like to think the more sort of as touchstones, but they're kind of the main things that these laws cover. So it's things like you need to specify your purpose and stick to that purpose. So you can't just process personal information willy-nilly for any reason. You've got to have a reason up front. Part of that is documenting that process. That's where the governance aspect comes in. Then you've got to limit your processing and any further processing. So you've got to make sure that the processing you're doing is in line with that purpose. Your third principle is what we call data minimization. So that's the idea that you shouldn't get more data than you need to do what you need to do with it. Then comes along your information security obligation. That's the one I talked about at length. That's the obligation to prevent unauthorized access to personal data. Then another big one is data subject participation. And then the last one, sort of a bundle of other things that kind of go along with that. That's things like the right to be forgotten and to update your data. So it's not enough for people to be able to ask you what data do you have on me and you can glibly tell them. They've got to be able to say, well, that data is wrong. I need it fixed. You know, for example... Yeah. A certain yeah, cell phone yeah. company for many years sent me correspondence addressed to Reverend David Lett, and I'm not ordained and never had been. Had up here been the law, I would have had a vector to kind of correct that. They've since fixed it somehow, which means they've been washing their data somewhere. Mada Bedi, I take it that you've been promoted because you want to ask a question. Yeah, really no, it's not a question you. per se. Maybe it's just a comment in terms of the nice explanation that David has laid down in terms of the principles. In yes. anything, especially when you refer to governance or compliance, there are two school of thoughts. One school of thought is the one that we always complain about or we will sort of shy away when people are asked to do certain things and then they use the term compliance, then it comes across as a tick box. In this instant, as a security or a privacy practitioner, I want us to I want to warn sort of warn everyone that remember all the inputs including the principles that are going to be laid down that we need to use as fundamentals in terms of building the security on top of it or making sure that because it's all about data it's all about protecting the data that you have in your environment or in your company mm -hmm. protecting the data whether it's your own data clients data employees data but you protect it because we know what happens when that data gets in the hands of wrong people so if we look at copy from an angle of compliance trust me you've already taken a wrong detour which is going to expose us to the actual risk and threats that you're trying to circumvent in this instant. So I want us to remember that all the inputs, including the principle, they are inputs, but there is an output. What is an output? It's an output, it's a secured environment. It's an environment where you can justify even if you get hacked or you get breached, where you say, I have done my best in making sure that I protect the pipeline that David referred to as a plumber. I've put all the necessary stuff. I kept on increasing and improving them. By the end of the day, if you get hacked or get breached, you can prove that I've done that. But the issue is not just 
doing it for the sake of complying. It's doing it for the sake of making sure that your environment is protected. The data, the joys of the company is protected. Guess what? When you get breached, it doesn't matter whether you complied. No, I get your point, Modibedi, and that's a very good one. Thank you. I think that Shamila has asked a question which leads into what Modibedi was saying is how do companies now prove they popular compliant? And as you said, David, a couple of times, it's not an end destination. It's a change in business process and practice. So how do we prove that we are compliant, Johan? I can pass the legalities over to David. From okay. a technology point of view, I see a lot of people are asking towards the checklist side of things. So the act is not a checklist, as we sort of already established. But from an IT point of view, if you look at your IT safety standards that's out there, that's the checklist you can basically go through from a technology side to say, have I made the appropriate provisions to encrypt data when it's basically sitting off premise? Am I okay. encrypting tapes that go offside? So there's a lot you can do on a technology side to lock it down. But okay. is that going to help you? And that's where I'm going to pass over to David from a legal side. To Maybe I can dive in there. If a company has thrown their resources at securing the data, has done their best about protecting the data in the way they can, and then a big hacker from some European country comes in and slams the walls down, clears their data out. Are they still going to be punished for that, even though they've done their best? As Moriberi said, if you get hacked, you get hacked. And the heads will roll no matter kind of what you've done at the end of the day. But it's uh, also, it's a reality of business. There's something valuable in your house. Someone's going to steal it. And the extent yeah. to which you get punished largely depends on the mitigation steps you've taken. And I mean, sure. we see this in Europe. So the big data breaches in the past few years in the UK have been the Mario Total Group's breach and the British Airways breach. Those fines yeah. got handed down recently. They were sort of in the, you know, hundreds of millions of pounds initially. And they've been reduced to sort of 20 million pounds, which is still a lot of money. Yeah but they cited reasons actually investigating what they had done to prevent the breaches and things like that. Yeah. And, you know, the, the unfortunate climate for people in the travel and tourist industries and things yeah. like that. Yeah. But if you go to Germany, particularly is a great example of how the regulators handle these things. Often if a breach happens, they'll investigate the steps you took and it's a mitigating factor. Of what's okay. okay. So they're not going to double slap you. Um, no. Nicholas Dulings asked us a number of good questions from an IT data security provider perspective. What are the foreseeable legal ramifications of archive? data ex-gestion costs to client data owner when they choose to change service provider and the current vendor will not release archive data to the client until the ex-gestion fee is paid wow that's a big question did you get sure that is. Dave mm, yeah I'm not sure what that fee is that's being referred to like it, it sounds Can like you hold the client's data to ransom yeah. So if we've archived the data and it's secure and all the rest and you're moving somewhere and I'm bitter about that, can I charge you an exorbitant fee for my data? Data protection law doesn't speak to all of that. You know, a lot of general commercial law will deal with kind of the holding of data to ransom. What data protection law does speak to is this idea of data portability, which is a lot like the idea of number portability in the cell phone world that we're familiar with in South Africa. And it's not codified in POP here, so you won't find a section specifically talking about data portability, but it is in GDPR. So if you interpret POP here in terms of its global context, the right of data portability is at least implied. And in, uh, particularly in South Africa, one unusual thing about our data protection law is it extends the definition of data subjects to juristic persons. So most data protection law only applies to living human beings like you and me. South Africa it applies to companies, trusts, and CCs. It's done that before in other countries like Austria and Switzerland and Italy, but they've all since overturned that. Okay. But it does mean that if you put that together with the right of data portability, you as a business could invoke that to say, you can't charge me for my data. I need, I need it given to me. It's my right to move it somewhere else. It's my data. And that's, that's where that comes from. Look, the important distinction there is that would have to be your data as a business. A lot of what businesses think of as our data is data belonging to our data subjects that we actually have custodianship of. We don't own it. We can't, you know, ownership implies you have the right to do and, and, and dispose of it as you see fit. And, and you really don't. Dominic, you've got a question. Hi, thanks, man. Since the frenzy of Papaya has come along, there's been a frenzied amount of queries coming through from the business, and particularly from a report perspective where people are saying you are extracting personal data and it now needs to be protected. Mm -hmm. And I personally, I'm trying to match the law with what people are asking for, 
mm. where the report that's going to get extracted is from internal audit and internal audit by default do not share that information. Mm. The question I have is how do we as IT governance in my company decide if this is actually worth going through the whole process or to actually say, look, this is actually protected, that this report only gets to the MD and that's how it is. How, where do you stop the line of this? Because there's a lot of them coming through. So it goes back to the governance question. And, you know, IT often gets asked this question and in many ways, it's sort of unfair to lay it at their door. The person where the buck stops from a data protection perspective within the business in terms of Popia is called the information officer. And it's a role that existed prior to Popia. It was actually created by PIA, the Promotion of Access to Information Act. But one of their jobs is to make sure that the business is complying with relevant data protection laws. So you would refer that sort of question to them and they would be helping you decide essentially your access control levels and rules and things like that for different people within the business. And they'd help resolve that. Now they can be one person, they can be a whole department, they can have deputy information officers, they can have privacy champions within different business units. That's the whole governance game in terms of how you want to structure that. But in terms of making that decision, they would determine that in various documents, they'd have what's called a record of processing activities, where it's, I mean, the most simple version of it is a spreadsheet. There's lots of software out there that does it, but really you're, you're trying to keep track of what personal data you have in different systems within your business and who you're sharing it with and why. And if this is a regular thing, a question's coming up, say, you know, the results of audit reports, there'll be a line in your record of processing activities saying we have audit report data and it's authorized to be shared with the following people within the business or external third parties for that matter. So that's how I'd solve that one. And if you don't formalize it, you're actually going to be hindering business. Yeah. Because we're going to be looking inside as opposed to looking at where the customer is. All I'm seeing is bureaucracy coming down. You've got to help me see through that, Johan. Are we doing bureaucracy for the sake of bureaucracy here? I think if we take a step back from all of us that's on this call, it's obviously protecting all of our personal data as a first step. So that your address, your ID number, all your names, your address and whatever doesn't get into the the wrong hand. So it's basically protecting us. So yes, it potentially could see him as a lot of enforcement and stuff being pushed down on mm. us. But I think the important bit that we always need to understand, it is there to help all of us. So that's first of all, mm. from my side. The second thing is, we need to realize that as IT professionals, if we've got wide open environments where we just leave files, and as David said, we haven't defined who should have access to them, and who's mm. got access to them today, what is sitting on a guy that's traveling around his laptop you know, is there personal mm. identifying information mm. there? You know, and we start buttoning that down and saying, you know, creating that, that, you know, once again, going back to the business process and the, the governance within the business, creating a customer facing individual. What type of information should he have about me as an individual mm. to do his mm. job? And you basically start pinning that down. But as I said, where we see most of the landmines today is about the bits you don't know what you have out there, yes. which is the concerning so bit. So I'm going to take a two-minute pause here and just run through some questions. There's some very okay. interesting ones that are coming through. So everybody who's given questions, thank you. We will get to them. Firstly, Anonymous said we had to generate reports on our employees to do call-outs during COVID. These lists have been distributed and offline. Should we get those lists removed to be compliant? I think it's a resounding, absolutely get the lists back and work off the centralized ERP system or whatever system so that you got one version of the truth. Then Roxanne throws in a curveball. David, I think this might be for you. What are your thoughts on cloud providers in the US and EU? Should we move off US cloud solution providers and switch to availability zones to EU GDPR compliant AZs? The yeah. cloud is always a sticky point. A lot of people think cloud's bad news and yeah, it does depend on the cloud. Um, I think the reason that people are worried about US versus EU, there's been a recent court case called Schrems 2, where there's a very litigious Australian gentleman by the name of Maximilian Schrems, who has made a career out of suing the likes of Facebook and, you know, for good reason to kind of protect the public interest. And in his most recent case, they successfully overturned Privacy Shield, which was essentially the legal agreement between the European Union 
and uh, the US in terms of which personal data was lawfully being transferred. And it was turned down on the same reasons that Safe Harbor was declared invalid, which kind of blew up in the wake of the whole Edward Snowden debacle. So now that that's been declared invalid, the whole question is, well, you know, should I be using cloud providers in the US because you're worried about your data being accessed by state actors and things like that in that country? If you want to be absolutely safe, then yes, you know, use Europe. Okay. But, you know, there's by no means been a halt of business between the US and Europe. You know, if you go to Ireland and you go to the Silicon Docks, you'll see all the big Facebooks, Googles, they're still doing business with their US counterparts. They do so on the basis of various other cross-border transfer mechanisms. So the one that Fritz used most often are called the SCCs, the Standard Contract Clauses. And those typically get incorporated into a data processing agreement between the European entity and the US entity. And that essentially creates an artificial data protection pipe between the entities. Now, okay. the validity of those was also a tech challenge in that case. Ultimately, they did survive the case, but they're on very shaky ground and they're currently being reworked by the European Data Protection Board. So okay. this is relevant to South Africa because in many ways, relative to Europe, we're in a very similar position to the US. Until Papia actually commences, we do not have similar or better data protection law than them. So you can't legally transfer personal data to us without some sort of cross-border transfer mechanism, the most common of which is a DPA incorporating the SCCs. To answer the question coming from the attendee there, you can't go wrong using the right service providers in GDPR jurisdictions, then the GDPR will help protect you. But US, you need to jump through some additional hoops to make that cross-border. Thank data you. Lawful. Yeah. Johan, I've got Hemu asking me a question here. Should data quality and metadata traceability not be part of your principles? I think your absolutely. On that? Uh, absolutely. I, and, and it boils back to then, obviously, once again, know about what you have. So I will definitely say it should form part of your plan or, or your compliance strategy. It all goes back to, as I said, look, if your IT organization is buttoned down like it should, you've got all your security levels in there. That makes life easier for you. I've got an interesting one here from Terry, which is how does this apply to people protecting the data of their friends and family? Is there a requirement for us to protect this data? And let's extrapolate to WhatsApp or email function. There's a very specific in pop here that says it doesn't apply to processing personal information for ordinary household activities. So uh, the example I like to give there is your kid comes home with a report card and you want to discipline them for getting bad marks. They can't invoke the right to privacy to say that, you know, you couldn't read their report card. It doesn't apply okay. to normal household activities. So they're, they're, out, they're out of luck on that one. But yeah, so the definition of normal household activities is up for debate and there'll certainly be gray areas, but some sort of informal social group on WhatsApp, it's not going to apply to that. And, you know, for good reason. It's not for this discussion, but I've got two kids at school and we've been for so many social media talks about social media and the dangers of information out there. So that's a whole different discussion that we could go into. And maybe the principle is your family needs to think about Papier in their own family context. And what do you put out there? It's always out there. It's forever out there but it's probably a discussion for a different forum with a different focus and the hurt that can be done and the fact that you can go to jail and all sorts of stuff, but it's not Papia. Thomas asked a question, how does Papia affect information gathered by law enforcement investigation units? Going back to Papia myths that we're busting, it applies as much to public sector as it does to private sector. So certain things that will trigger when it comes to law enforcement is a class of personal information called SPI, special personal information. And part of that is your criminal record and criminal activity. So that'll definitely fall under that. And that information just requires a higher level protection. Often if you're collecting that, you'll have a specific privacy notice apart from your privacy policy saying, I'm collecting your criminal data for whatever reason. And you'll kind of get specific if not consent, then at least a notification that that's happening. And the one thing to bear in mind, though, also any kind of state law body will have certain powers in terms of legislation, and that can often override what's happening in terms of data protection law. So the yeah. one other myth, yeah. myth that exists, a lot of people think Papier and other data protection laws are consent-based. The only real law in the world that's consent-based from that perspective is the Indian data protection laws. Papier is not like that. There's several justifications, and one of the common ones is a legal reason. So you don't need consent as a legal reason for okay. collecting personal data. Just as ignorance is no protection either from this law. If your employees are creating their own databases on their laptops for whatever reason, and that gets stolen, who's liable? 
So from a legal perspective, it would be the business because you are part of that entity. If they, I mean, if they're doing it in the course and scope of their employment, there's a bunch of tests and labor law, you know, from that perspective. But if they are, then the business would be liable. But believe you me, if it finds that you're the person who wasn't obeying the company information security policies, you know, good luck at your next salary review. And uh, yeah. you'll probably yeah. be in short order. Sure. So it can, it can definitely be ascribed to you. But in terms of Papia, it stops with the, the what we call the controller or the responsible party as your employer. In fact, you are part of okay. that party as an employee. If you're a contractor or you're a separate legal entity, it'll be slightly different. You might fulfill the role of a processor or, or an operator. I'm using these terms interchangeably. Yeah. The, the global term is, is processor. In South Africa, we talk about operator. The global term is controller. In South Africa, we talk about responsible party. But uh, okay. as, a, as a sort of a third party contractor, you will most likely fulfill the role of an operator there. And then there'd be a data processing agreement again that would ultimately push responsibility onto you. So while in law it might be laid at your controller's door or your responsible party's door through the contractual chain, they can hold you liable through warranties and indemnities and things like that. Okay. I'm going to ask one more question. The information officer, would this be an IT person? Currently, Poppy is sitting with the IT manager. Do you need a resource for that function or can it sit within IT? And what are you seeing from your customers? What's the common area where you see the person who looks after it, Poppy? It's depending on, obviously, Daniel, the size of the organization. Obviously, your smaller, your smaller organizations, we do, do see that land up in IT, typically on the IT manager's desk. And I would say if he's properly trained, that's most probably a, a good thing to do because he can look at both sides of the fence, you know, okay. and, and what's required. Obviously, larger organizations, we do see uh, specific individuals and also committees. So you, you will get a, you'll get your IT manager and you'll get someone from legal and you'll get your compliance officer basically having regular reviews of our policies being met. Is it enforced? Mm -hmm. Where's risk? Because I think one of the things as well is if something happens, you need to tell someone as well. I mean, and that needs to go to that committee. So larger, larger companies, we do see them a bit more people involved. There's not only one person, uh, to put it that okay. way. So there's not one size fits all, just like there isn't a checklist that we can go through and attain this nirvana of poppy compliance. That's a continual. Warren Koopman was saying that they do poppy training for all new users and with the vendors on a yearly basis, labeling data as much as possible. They have policies and guidelines to InfoSec policy, you know, and he's asking, is that enough? So I'm gonna wait for that, David, until Paul has asked his question. Mr. Fuyani. Thank you very much. The point that came across was the point around if somebody's got like sensitive data from maybe on their laptop or wherever, what are the implications from the organization if the data is stolen? So what I've seen in most of the organizations I've worked with is obviously they've put down measures in place to try and curb those issues, such as making sure that there's some kind of encryption that's happening on the data and making sure that from the management, uh, managing certain groups of users, that those certain policies are enforced to make sure that sensitive data that is sitting on the machine, that machine is bit locked, there's some kind of information protection policies that are in place. And unfortunately, there's documents that you sign, disclosures and all those kind of things, and sometimes very fireable situations if that data was stolen and your machine didn't have the appropriate policies mm -hmm. and bit locking of that data. What's your question you've got for our panel? From an IT perspective, what kind of solutions would you have okay. to put down in place to make sure that you know you're dealing with sensitive data that's sitting on prem mm. as mm. opposed to data mm. that's sitting on the cloud? If we talk to a lot of IT execs, I'm going to take a bit of a step back. To mine through a lot of data, an unstructured form on premise is always mm. problematic. Let's you know be uh, candid around that. We all digital pack rats. We keep everything. We're too scared to delete anything. And as the terabyte hard drives goes up, we just pack more in. We just throw more at it. Yeah. So obviously, it is to make sure that you scan for that sensitive data. You define what is sensitive data. Go and look at your unstructured data because I think structured data, typically, you've got a DBA that can tell you. I've got an ID number in a field which is accessible to the following people, et cetera. 
When it gets to unstructured, that's where we see a lot of challenges coming through. So the first thing is you need to have an algorithm out there that basically as stuff gets created, it identifies what's coming through and being put down onto the unstructured side of things. That will flag, you know, I've got sensitive data sitting in a folder. Then you can, it, it doesn't make a decision for you. Then you as business, your compliance officer, IT manager can sit down and make a decision. Should that person have access to it? Should we delete it? Is it valid business reasons? And make the business and obviously legal decisions around that information. So mm. you need a mechanism to catch that. And that starts from the back. So you first have to go through all the unstructured data. Once you've classified mm. and defined that, then you can carry on and put the policy down for going forward. And it's also depending, obviously, on the maturity of your organization, where, how far they've gone down the privacy. It sounds like you've done quite a lot on the endpoint mm. side because you identified the risk there already. So hopefully mm -hmm. I've answered your question there, Paul. It's like Shamila made a comment in the question session, which is business and IT need to understand where the weakest link is so that you can secure it and be compliant. And that's ever going to be a changing thing. I mean, the theory of constraints talks around your constraints always going to be moving around. So I agree with you. Jacques just raises an interesting point in the questions where he says something that's often done in South Africa is scanning of your license card and your license disc and your driver's license. How is this allowed by Poppy? So the one thing to understand first of all, Poppy is not yet an act of law. It only commences on the 1st of July, 2021. Okay. Just happening now doesn't mean it will be allowed under, under Poppy. Having said that, you know, there's no specific provision in Poppy that says you can't do this, you can't do that. It says you have to do things for a justifiable purpose in terms of what you're doing. Now, you know, often the place where they scan your, your license discs and things like that are places where previously you would have to write your name in a book to say you're going somewhere. And, yeah. you know, that book is not particularly secured. Going back to the argument about structured or unstructured data, you know, putting something in a notebook is barely a structure. Anyone can access that and, and, and read that. You know, a digitized system, you're kind of invoking here some provisions to do with automated processing. You've essentially got a computer yeah. there running this against a database. I mean, it depends once again, what they do with that database. You know, if they're now running it against some sort of motor vehicle database to work out who you are, that would be a massive breach of pop here. I, I but know you probably yeah. can't, but David, I know you probably can't remember this because we've been under lockdown for so long, but last time you checked into a hotel where they take your ID and your passport and your firstborn children's birth certificate and all of these things scan the hell out of it and then they just chuck it in the desk. Surely that's so that's what we're talking around here. They certainly challenge the principle of data minimization. And, you know, in a post pop peer world, uh, as we've seen in, in Europe under the GDPR and their previous data protection laws, you'd have to have a reason for collecting that information and you'd have to secure it. So, yeah, that sort of unstructured throwing bits of paper in a drawer probably isn't going to fly under pop peer. But once again, it comes down to a question yeah. of enforcement and what happens. You know, at the end of the day, the regulators are, I always quote Animal Farm by George Orwell, who says uh, all pigs are equal, some pigs are more equal than others. Under data protection law, all obligations are equal, some obligations are more equal than others, in that information security and data subject participation are the things that regulators hand out fines for much more often than collecting too much data. So it doesn't mean that they're not going to do it, but they're much more concerned with that. They've, to a certain extent, got bigger fish to fry. If there's lots of breaches and things like that yeah. happening and lots of complaints from data subjects, doesn't mean they won't get to that. Yeah. But uh, it's important to see kind of where their focus lies. So, I mean, Johan, I'm, I'm not going to ask you this question. I'm making a comment. I think it's obligation on people like Commvault to be talking to our small and medium companies on how they take these processes or almost at a departmental level when we look at organizations. But I've got a higher grade question from Roberto. Do we need to enter in DPAs with our customers as we process their personal data? However, if we host our customers' data in cloud with data centers outside of South Africa, do we need to enter in cross-border DP agreements with each of these data center providers? And Roberto is legal counsel for TIBCO. So DPA stands for a data processing agreement. And to talk in tech terms, it is the driver between two parties and lets them interface with each other from a data protection perspective. 
So it means that this entity in this jurisdiction can transfer data legally to this entity in that jurisdiction. Now they can be within one jurisdiction, in which case there's no cross border yeah. transfer happening, or they can be across international jurisdictions. Now it sounds like what he's talking about where he's got customers data going to cloud providers. So let's say you have a cloud provider like AWS and you're using an offshore data center somewhere, there will be a data processing agreement between you and them. Typically, those organizations will have a stock standard DPA on their website that you can just download and sign. They're signing so many, they're not really interested in negotiating them with people. If you want one, you go grab one at the end of the day, or it's built into their terms. Whereas you on a consumer side, you have an opportunity to enter into one with your customer. You can try and roll it into your existing customer agreement, but often it's a quite a complicated thing. Often it ends up being separate. Basically the DPA is, it's kind of like the NDA of the data protection world. It's supposed to be a high velocity contract. The trouble is it's still very new. It's still being established exactly what goes into these things. There's a lot of variation around it still. Over time, it'll become more and more settled. And the same way we don't you know, put a second thought to signing a non-disclosure agreement, at some point we'll treat DPAs in the same way, but we're really not there yet, particularly from a South African perspective. Hemu has asked, is activity related data on the internet, such as website searches for products under the ambit of Poppia for marketers to avoid? When you say marketers to avoid, you know, that is still personal or, data. Or avoid exploitation. Yeah, avoid exploitation. So personal data is any information that can be tied back to an identifiable human being or juristic person. So the test there is whether it's anonymized to the extent that it can't be re-identified. And that's a pretty tall order in the modern world with big data and machine learning and AI and things like that. It's very easy to re-identify data sets. So we often end up yeah. treating many things as personal data. But yes, your search history, your cookie activity, all that sort of stuff is personal data under popular. Okay. Moretti has asked a really good question. Um, I was just thinking about walking into a mall. Do you remember that before lockdown, we all used to go to malls and you get people conducting market research. And I know a lot of it's gone online now. Popia must be really important for these, for this whole industry. So it's important to have varying levels of encryption on the data. Yes, that's a taken. How can companies in the market research industry ensure compliance? Johanna, are you up for that? Or is this, um, are we tossing it over to David again? Depending how the data is captured, but the one thing that I just want to add on to it, if it's captured electronically and you can identify, look, we've captured this, then obviously you can make a decision how long you keep that data. And then I'll pass it over to David for the, obviously for the, the legal angle on that. Sure. And I think it's an important distinction between electronic and non-electronic data. And you just gave the scenario of, you know, a person standing in a mall with a physical clipboard. So yep. what's interesting about POP here is we've incorporated rules around direct marketing into our law. If you go to Europe, it's such a separate law. But essentially yeah. what happens here is there's a distinction between electronic messages and non-electronic messages. So okay. if I'm standing across from you, this is a non-electronic marketing transaction. A whole different set of rules apply. I don't need your consent to ask you about things like that face to face. Yeah. Where yeah. this is relevant is a phone call is actually analogous to a face to face conversation. It's not an electronic communication. So we're going to see a lot okay. more call marketing happening in a post pop here world. So the rules no, around gosh, no, please no. <laughs> Everyone has my number. They think I'm Rockefeller. I keep telling them I'm the other fella. I don't have the money. <laughs> it's like, stop phoning me. So you're saying that's going to ramp up? going to ramp up but on the electronic side the rules currently were what's called an opt-out regime which means people can get your data from anywhere they're allowed to send you electronic messages with impunity provided they give you an opportunity to opt out within certain requirements we're going to move to what is currently the european standard which is an opt-in regime which means you get one chance to ask someone about widgets and if they don't say i want to know about widgets you're not supposed to contact them again that one chance it's not okay. clear if it's in a lifetime the best thinking I've seen on it is it depends on what you're marketing. So like something like, like life insurance, for example, people tend to change their life insurance every sort of five years or so. So it would be reasonable to refresh that consent every five years or so. So it's very consent based is what we're moving towards. And at once again, we're late to this party. Europe's already moving away from consent based direct marketing towards what they call legitimate interest direct marketing, which is where you can show that the person you're marketing to has a legitimate interest to find out what you know about them or what you want to market them. And the way you determine that is by knowing more about them. So that is that is like sci fi future direct marketing. That's not in Dude, that is so scary. But that is what we'll get to eventually. But, yep. um,
That is so scary. I've watched the great hack. I understand what they're doing with us. When you go and you, I happen to be looking at trail running stuff and next thing I'm getting all these specials from companies. Okay, cool. Belinda asked a question on what does the law say about paper-driven organizations? And I think you've just touched on that quite nicely from a paper interview perspective. I don't know if it's about paper-driven organization as such. Is there something you want to add there? headline there is Poppy applies as much to hard copy records as it does to electronic records. So whether they're in a filing cabinet or in an electronic system, you still have to protect them. Okay. Yeah. That, you have we to, definitely you see anything. Yeah, we're obviously seeing a lot of digitization happening. A lot of people are taking that paper at the moment and getting them scanned in with OCR and all that type of stuff and then stored okay. into massive repositories. And I, I think the bit there is, is you need to remember that what you do with the original copy is most probably decide if you should destroy it. And the end of the day. Okay. Brilliant. Hanley has asked what training would the IT manager require? And and I'm going to take this and I'm going to go right back to the beginning of the call, Hanley. And it's it's like going to gym. If you're training for a marathon in the first week, you don't run a 32. You're going to be running a couple of short runs to get into it and make sure you're okay. I think it's the same thing. There are certain steps and foundations you need to get in place in order to understand that this is a never-ending process that IT and business need to go on and you need to get fit for Poppia. So engaging with people like Johan and David sets you up to understand which bases are most important to cover, are our systems okay, our interfaces, our processes, and move from there. Don't get too complex too soon because then you're going to miss the fundamentals. I've got a long question from Doug, and then depending who's answering it, guys, we've got five minutes. I would like to understand what you are seeing customers do for the next six to seven months until we get uh, legislation enforced, and what would be the two pieces of advice you would give to the folk that we've got on the call. But Doug Jenkins has just asked, as a comms company, we process personal data of our clients' customers, both structured and unstructured. We need all the data we get to conduct our service. Compared to GDPR, what are our responsibilities towards making sure our clients have permission to pass that data on? And what compliance problems should we look out for as data processor down the chain? How do we handle it when we may be third or fourth in the comms process chain? David, that's straight to you, unfortunately. Sorry. Uh, I don't mind. So one of the other kind of core principles born out in data protection was this idea of direct collection from the data subject. So typically you should get your personal data from the source, but you know, as this delegates correctly asked, no organization is is an island. We all work together. So they're part of the chain. They're maybe fourth down the chain and they're relying on people up the chain to get the necessary lawful basis for processing that personal information. So maybe someone else is connecting consent on their behalf or someone else has got the legal contracts that the processing is based on. The way you protect yourself is in your data processing agreements, you have warranties and indemnities from the people higher up the chain that they're doing what they have to do in terms of data protection law. So that if for whatever reason, the processing is unlawful, you have some way of you know, holding yourself and protecting yourself against their failure to comply with data protection laws. Okay, brilliant. So Johan, in summary, from a Commvault perspective, what are you advising customers to do in this last six month sprint before this law, which is not an opt-in law, it's coming. Uh, what are you, what so, are you advising? Daniel, I think the most important thing for me is, it's not to stick your head in the sand and think it's gonna go away. I think it's there. So I would say, start getting your ducks in a row. So that's okay. the first thing. Mm -hmm. The second thing is, you don't know how much you are at risk unless you know your data. Once again, I go back to the multi-cloud environment, which is fantastic. We, we're all adopting that. And we've had lots of questions about cloud already and you know about Office 365 and I've got stuff on-prem and I've got stuff on a laptop. It's the bits you don't know about that's most probably going to be the ones that potentially can sort of get you into trouble. So mm. start getting your data governance and your data information security and get more insight into your data, get that yeah. sorted. I know it's a tremendous task. There's companies out there that's got quite a lot, but start the process. Don't wait for 1st of July next year, like a couple of companies in Europe did, and then start scurrying around to try and fix things. David? I agree with you on that, Johan. And you know, to frame it, the way I like to say it is you've got to talk the talk and walk the walk. And talking the talk is telegraphing that you're complying with these laws. Part of that's making sure all your customer facing stuff's right, your privacy policies, your legal terms, get that right. 
in terms of walking the walk, you've got to stand on the shoulders of giants. You know, why go out there and find all your little bits of data by yourself? There's technology out there that can help you do that. If you leverage that effectively, you're going to be in a better position than someone who hasn't done that. So it's about telling everyone your house is in order and then actually starting to get your house in order behind the scenes. And it's going to put you in a better position than people who aren't doing that. Thank you so much, guys. It's been an hour that could easily be two or three. From my perspective, I just want to say to the business users out there, this is not an IT problem. To all the IT users, this is not a business problem. This is an our problem that we need to deal with. And it's actually improving the business. So um, we need to all jump on this and become poppy fit. Thank you for Commvault and Tech Central for dragging David out from the cold in Cape Town and Johan from Midrant or somewhere yep. and allowing us to have some of your time. This has been a really excellent discussion. I've thoroughly enjoyed it.